Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Let me talk about the most important point in Zen, which is clarity. If your mind is clear, everything is clear. If you attain this moment, you attain substance. These sentences may sound abstract, but as you practice, they gain meaning. Zen does not really explain. It does not have those huge intellectual structures that you may be accustomed to from other traditions. What we have is four principles that we do not depend on scriptures. We directly point to human mind. Attainment of our true nature means we wake up and become Buddhas. And transmission is only possible between mind to mind. These are the four principles. Wherever these are in operation, we can talk about Zen. Zen originally means becoming one. Jhana means absorption, depth, oneness, non-duality, all of these. Maybe not as the dictionary would tell you, but operationally, that's what this means. In the Buddha's time, there were the jhana schools, those schools that meditated rather than thought about life and death. Jhana became Channa in China, then it became Chan in Korean Son, and in Japan, Zen. So the practice-oriented schools, they are called Zen, the direct experience-oriented schools. Of course, most other Buddhist schools they have meditation practice, in fact, intense meditation practice. But that intensive meditation is sometimes coupled with a lot of books and thinking, etc., etc. Zen teaches you how to attain a mind which is before thinking, before duality appears. That's our true nature. If you like, it is beyond dualities, beyond conceptual thinking or emotional patterns. Language has past, present and future. Language is dimensional. Language is cognitive. So with one word, it's impossible to convey the essence of Zen. Rather, when we return with our experience before thinking, We wake up. When you hear this sound, there is no thinking. There is no duality. There is no good and bad, me or you, right or wrong. That moment is our awakening. It's impossible to put it into words because as substance, it has no name and no form. When I taught you today earlier the perception of sound, it was actually teaching you this hit in a very soft, calm, and clear way. Do you hear the bird sound? That's the hit right now. Makes your mind very clear because you only perceive the bird sound, just like you perceived the hit of the Zen stick earlier. When you attain substance, then your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. This mirror reflects everything. The birds are singing, we are sitting in a nice zendo. The wall is white in front of me and red behind me. We see clearly, hear clearly, taste, smell, touch, and think clearly. Our emotions become clear for us because they are all reflected in our mind mirror. We call this the truth. Truth is not an abstract concept. Truth is not some philosophy it's a derivative of truth as we experience it directly at best. And sometimes these intellectual structures are loaded with ignorance, ideas, expectations, projections, distortions. If your mind is clear, you attain substance. Then you can see the truth. You can perceive the world as it is. And based on truth, you can perform correct function. Okay? Somebody's bleeding, give them a bandage. Somebody's thirsty, give them drink. Somebody's hungry, give that person food. Very simple. But 
Many times our ideas are so much clouding our minds that we insist on giving drink to somebody who is hungry. And we enforce food on a thirsty person. Because it's our idea that it's good for you. I know that. So I'm giving it to you and you must take it. And Zen is pretty much the same as a spiritual school. If you believe that your experience helps you, then follow it. Live up to it. But if your experience is not something that proves helpful for you, then feel free to discard it. And it's not up to the pleasant or unpleasant nature of meditation. You go to the dentist, most of the time it's unpleasant. But you have to do it because you know that it takes away suffering. And sometimes very pleasant things give you suffering, so at some point you say it's enough. A little bit of very pleasant impressions, that's good. But you take too much of the same substance, then that gets you into trouble. Amsterdam is the city of abundance. So it has a lot of teaching about what is enough. I've seen wonderful places today, ate wonderful food. I've seen a lot of freedom. And I've seen very happy faces, very burnt out faces, very clouded minds and very clear minds in the same city. Wherever I went, irrespective of the person's color of the skin or the age or the gender, all that didn't matter. What mattered is how much did they take of this abundance? When did they say it's enough? So Zen is actually helping you in many ways. It sounds very transcendental when we say, lose your illusions, become one, attain your true nature, attain your true self. Many people in the West these days, they ask, can this be a little bit more practical? Of course, it could be more practical. But then we lose the apex, we lose the most important direction of it, and then we take the most essential part out. I always say, meditate very sincerely and wait for the side effects to come, without any expectations. This original mind has no name, no form, originally. But we call this don't know. It's the most honest designation because I didn't lie to you. I didn't say it's Buddha or God or put a statue or an image over it. And I ask you to identify with that. I'm not doing so. But this don't know is not the lack of information. It's the absence of ignorant views. So paradoxically, in Zen tradition, I met some of the most intelligent people in my life. And they were teaching don't know. You see the irony of that? So Zen is loaded with professional paradoxes called kongans. Kongans are test cases, like you test a car on various terrains in various conditions, hot and wet and dry and freezing. So you enter with your mind various situations, various seemingly irreconcilable opposites, unresolvable problems, very complex situations. And if your mind can stay simple, clear, non-dualistic, then you can reflect the solution like an object in a mirror. But if your mind is not clear, then you fall to one side of the horse, either the good side or the bad side. Either you become very upset at the Kongan, or you become totally relaxed and say, oh, this is fine, I'm not going to deal with this. I give you an example. Zen master Kobong in China had three gates. If anyone passed these three gates, he got transmission. The first, the sun in the sky shines everywhere. Why does a cloud obscure it? So now, of course, you could go into lengthy explanations about meteorology, vapor, and physics, and chemistry. That's not what we are interested in. Give me an answer without thinking. Just reflecting it, becoming one with it. And then you enter Zen. Like I've said, Zen is oneness, absorption, becoming one. Next, everyone has a shadow following them. 
How do you not step on your shadow? I can see your minds are going wild with simulations, computer programs and applications inside. How to solve this? And remember, if you think, your mind becomes cluttered with thoughts. You have a lot of feelings about it. I'll tell you a kongam very soon, which has a lot of feelings in it. Then your feelings clutter up your mind. So how do you stay clear? One, but not suppress your thoughts and emotions. If you can do this, then you use your karma. Your thoughts and emotions and speech and actions are at your disposal. But if you're attached to your karma, then your thoughts and emotions control you. Then you feel sometimes victimized by life or Kongan practice. And the third, this whole world, the entire universe is on fire. Throughout what kind of samadhi or deep meditation can you save yourself from being burned? As hot as this kongan is, it really freezes you. Because if you think you don't find a way out. I can see in some of your eyes, why is this necessary? Why do we have to go this far, so remote? Hundreds of years back to China, to Zen masters we never met and never knew. What's the use? Well, the use is that these kongans train your mind to stay clear at all times, in all situations. And most importantly, in the Kongan interview room, you can make mistakes without any penalty. In life, penalty with a mistake is always there. Sometimes you make one mistake and it takes years to clean it up. In the Kongan interview room, you come back next day, you try again. And what is really important is not the solution itself. If the solution itself was important, you know, then we would teach you what it is. We would publish it in a book. We don't. That's why interviews are private matter completely. The way you get there, what you have to get through, your own jungle, your own net of illusions, then when you discard that, when you transcend that, then you get to the correct solution. So Zen means becoming clear and staying clear in all situations at all times, in any circumstances. So today you have heard meditation instructions. I talked about the great question, what is this? This question is the key. The gate is the Kongan. Beyond the gate is clarity and brightness. So this one key opens all the gates. All right? But for that, you have to sacrifice all your prefixed ideas, all your images, all your illusions. That's all that you have to do, and then it works. If you want some intellectual help, there are many books. But books do not give you the experience. When you go to a restaurant, you do not eat the menu, you eat the food. But the menu gives you a pretty good guidance what kind of food you should choose. Philosophies, religions, various disciplines of science, they're like a bridge. Going from this place of not knowing enough to the place where your knowledge is complete. In the Buddha's terms, it's this shore, the suffering world, to the other shore, the pure land, non-duality, or nirvana, okay? or enlightenment. So most of these intellectual frameworks that I have mentioned act as a bridge. People made it for you. Great thinkers, prophets, visionaries, they made this bridge and if you want you can take this bridge and walk through it, see the structure, learn in the meantime, understand what the bridge is made of, educate yourself, and then when you're complete, the bridge is over, you're on the other shore. It sounds very simple, but like I've said before, we humans are very paradoxical. Sometimes we do not believe other people's thoughts. We want that to be verified. We want that to work before we step on the bridge. 
And once we step on the bridge, the road is not always straight. Sometimes we have doubts and we don't like the system. We feel that it's being imposed on us against our will. And that's when we blow up the bridge. That's when we undo all the nuts and bolts and then the bridge can fall apart. And some people jump from the bridge into the river. So people have a lot of adverse reactions to gradual realization practice, which was not created by them. Zen does not offer you this bridge. Rather, it points at your backpack that everyone has. This backpack contains your karma, contains subconsciously all your archetypes, every idea you've ever had about past, present and future, good and bad, right and wrong. And if you want to get started on this great journey, just be on the riverside and take one stone, one thing you believe in, and throw it into the river. And that becomes a stepping stone. And then you step on it. And you take the next stone and you throw that into the river, becomes another stepping stone and you step on it. And you continue like this, stone by stone, until your backpack your unnecessary karma, your unnecessary burden becomes empty. And when the last stone hits the river, the next step is the other shore. Before that, you don't see it. Only the direction is clear, that we don't want to go back. We don't want to go back to our own suffering or inflicting suffering on others. So this path of liberation is made by us. The direction is offered, but <clears throat> nobody can walk instead of you. We have to walk that path. And we build the bridge with our own effort by putting all our illusions into the river. And that becomes an asset. It becomes a stepping stone. Something that used to be a hindrance, like a wall before you. You take that wall apart and all those stones become a road surface. We can walk on that. And not alone, but together. Zen Master Sung San, my teacher, used to say, only go straight, don't know. These one-liners were very famous. So one day, they were returning from a Dharma talk somewhere on the East Coast by car from the location to the Zen Center. And the driver was not really clear which turn to take at an intersection. Sung San Sun was sitting in the back and he says, only go straight. Sir, we have to make a left towards the Zen center. And Sung San Sim said, okay, only go straight means sometimes you have to make a left. <laughs> <laughs> so this is straight. <laughs> I feel very appreciative that I could spend uh, six years with him in Korea and saw him before and after in various countries. And I believe that the teaching he has transmitted to us, has wonderful value. I also maintain that uh, if you do not feel that it's valuable for you, feel free to discard that. If you feel it's valuable, then try to grow up to it. This has been in existence for centuries, in fact millennia, but the way it's put forward towards us, that's very direct and very unique and speaking to your heart. So if you have any questions concerning Zen, meditation, cultures, East and West, this is the time to ask. Um, you just spoke of uh, unnecessary kar karma. Yeah. Is there necessary karma? Oh yes, there is. What's the difference? The difference is that, for instance, when you take a poop, the necessary karma is the habit of wiping your butt after that. The unnecessary karma is complaining about the smell. <laughs> More questions? I don't know how to react when someone makes me angry. Don't react. Don't. That's when you put all your energy back to your tantian. You don't use this engine of emotions because that produces anger at that time. Also here, there's intellectual cold anger sometimes. There's warm anger, cold anger. You do not give that out. You perceive it and you keep your energy in the tantian. If you suppress anger intellectually or emotionally, it comes back with a vengeance. Any suppressed karma is like that. Because you judge it, you put a negative dualistic label on top of it, goes into your subconscious, 
becomes stronger and in the worst possible moment it appears again and strikes again. Stronger than before. I think this is familiar. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, look inside how your mistakes appeared. The other mistake is giving it out. You do get angry, you do follow that emotional, intellectual, adverse reaction and you scream and you want to destroy the other guy. That's the other mistake. Giving way to it or suppressing it. Both are dualistic reactions. Don't fight, don't flee and don't freeze. These are the three important instructions. So don't fight, don't flee, don't freeze. Perceive anger. And once you perceive anger, there's a distance between you and that kind of karma. You can use that distance to take the energy out of it. And once you have taken the energy out of it, returned it to the Tantian, okay, then anger disappears without a trace. But if you react to anger with fear, or repulsion, or aggression, that anger becomes thicker because you supply it, you feed it. So then, this energy, which is very strong, you can change the polarity and uh, transform it into something else. It's possible. But for that, we need to practice. If you practice, this happens in a moment. Sometimes you hear this question, do Zen masters get angry? Oh yeah, for a split second, and it's gone. But if people don't train, if their minds are not clear, if they're attached to their karma, they get angry, and they're angry two weeks later, too. And it kills them. It consumes them. Okay? That's how attachments work. More questions? You talk about uh, uh, clear mind, uh, but I, I often think um, the mind is the problem. Mind is the solution as well as the problem. Which oh. one do you choose? <laughs> Both. <laughs> then you have two kinds of problems. <laughs> so, which one do you really choose? If you let your mind make problems, your habits produce problems, mm -hmm. then life becomes problematic. Then you're, you have to use the same mind with a different quality, with more clarity to produce the solution. I think in China there was a question by an old Zen master. He says, 60 years of looking into the same mirror. Don't you realize that is the same old fellow? So mind can be the problem and it can be the solution. Depends on you. What's the quality? Quality is clarity. But if it's adverse or negative quality, then it's a lot of ignorance, greed, anger, etc. Ultimate quality is clarity or awakening. Enlightenment is a pretty good solution for human problems, if we use it right. When your mind goes with you and you want to get loose, how do you do that? Sometimes you know it's not a reality, it's things you make up mm -hmm. in your mind and you want to get rid of it to feel good again. How do you do that? In your case, I would use a mantra. Because if your mind is in these endless cycles of producing delusions or bad impulses or habits that you don't want to follow, you have to come back to mantra practice. And this mantra actually absorbs all this habit force, this habit energy that your mind produces in the wrong way. How do you know it's wrong? Because it causes suffering, unhappiness, deprivation, dependence, all kinds of stuff. So you take that energy out. Put it into the mantra. The mantra is like your bank, your dharma bank. So all your assets you sell and it becomes mantra. This mantra you deposit in your dharma bank. And any time that you need some new quality, some new karma, you take some deposit out and you finance it. That's how it works. But don't fight your habits because they become stronger. Don't approve your habits because they also become stronger. Do it in between. In between is this very narrow path yeah. of staying clear. When I experience, um, um, when, when we were sitting and with the question, um, what is this? I get confused. Um, when I sit, I, I see it in my head, who is uh, like a distance. And then I'm confused and I think, when I see, what is this? 
there's distance, and I think nothing can hurt me. And then the, I'm afraid. Wow. <laughs> A simple question and so many complicated thoughts appear. Yes. Don't think that you don't have this, but he was the courageous one to ask the question. Basically, this kind of complicated reaction shows your intellectual habits totally intertwined with your emotional reactions. Just come back to the question and don't deal with this thinking. And this question, like I've said before, it's not an object-oriented question. You do not ask, what is this? Or, what is this? Or, what is this? It's directed inside to the very source of the question. Because the very source of the question is what sees with your eyes, hears with your ears, yeah. feels with your heart, thinks with your mind, and most importantly, says, I. But when it shuts up, it doesn't say anything. Then there is no I. Oh, that's a little bit afraid. But afraid. <laughs> afraid of what? <laughs> that you lose yes. your illusion of yes. self? Yes. Yeah. Come on, it's already illusory. You don't lose anything. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Well, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> For now. <laughs> yeah. But when you use the question, don't attach to just quiet and serenity because you will get there. Most of you are very smart. You don't follow uh, too many trains of thoughts if you are instructed to do so. And you get actually very simple but clear instructions. So you follow them, you get some serenity and quiet, but don't attach to that either. Use that. You finally get the empty mirror because you scrub it clean from all the spots and layers that used to be on it. But then use that mirror for reflection. Don't just adore it. Some people have become very quiet, very serene, very happy, and they want to stay like that forever. I call this the hermit complex. <laughs> Suddenly, they go into this self-imposed hermitage of their own living room, and they never want to get out because it's so quiet, and they learned how to quiet down the mind. That's also a mistake. That's what I call the attachment to emptiness. Before that, they were attached to karma to form. Now they're attached to emptiness, to substance. Do your practice, but use your mind. When your mind is clear, you can use it well. When your mind is not clear, you cannot use it so well. Okay? So, more steps are necessary. In this case, I suggest that group practice is also very important. So here people are very independent. I can see that. Last 36 hours, I've seen so many independent people, it's a miracle. But these independent people should also be able to form networks and groups when necessary. Human beings are very interesting. We love our freedom and autonomy, but when we are afraid, we need another person to relieve that. And we suddenly look for some networks, some groups, some friendships, some intimacy. Autonomy and cooperation, and that goes way beyond your question. But autonomy and cooperation are the two components of life that we actually must uphold in all cases of our karma, whether it's individual, couple, family, or group. Autonomy and cooperation. Keep a balance between them, and then you're fine. Then you can be a really flexible but autonomous human being. Remember that. More questions? Uh, you talked about uh, throwing stones in the river, illusions. Like, how do you decide for yourself where to start, which illusions? The stone which is the heaviest, mm -hmm. and it's hurting you most, usually it comes up to the surface of your backpack and you throw that in. How do you actually see it? Because you have the strongest adverse reactions, the strongest opposites or extremes towards that kind of karma. Either it makes you super happy and next time super depressed, or it makes you angry or greedy, but that kind of karma is the strongest. Begin with that. You ask, what is this? Where does this come from? Because the question actually has an object-oriented application too. First we clear the mirror and then we use it, as I have said. In practical application, 
You have this ugly big karma that is bothering you for years, maybe, or weeks, or just for a few hours. Then you ask, what is this? Where does this come from? And then the mirror functions in a very spontaneous and intuitive way, because all the missing jigsaw puzzle pieces start to fall into place. That's why we teach unmoving mind. Do not interfere with the process. Your intuition fills up the blank spots. You can see cause and effect much better. And your karma, as much as I say that you throw it out of your backpack, it's true. You become detached from it. You don't identify with it. it becomes a stepping stone and you step on it. When you step on your karma, you start to use it. Not the other way around. Before that, the stone was pulling you down. Now you step on the stone. Big difference. It always comes up to the surface, whichever you have to deal with. Okay. You posed three questions, and I'm very curious to know your version of the answer. Oh, I'm not going to tell you. Why not? Because it's your work to find out. Oh. If you are interested in Kongan answers, you have to use your own backpack and your own stones, but we give you the river. Is there one answer? Sometimes one, sometimes more. I promised you guys a very kind of emotionally challenging Kongan, and I'm going to tell you right now. Also your homework. A long time ago, in China, there was a great master, Nam Chon, or Nan Chuan. In his monastery, the monks found a cat. And the monks in the East Hall, the monks in the West Hall, started to argue about the cat. It's our cat. No, it's our cat. We feed her. We clean her. No, it's our cat. So this kind of brawl was going on. Lam Chon had enough of it, he grabbed his precepts knife, every Zen master had a knife with which they cut the first part of somebody's hair who wanted to become a monk, and then the rest was kind of with normal you know, procedure. But ritually, they had a knife, and he held up the cat and this precepts knife and said, all of you, give me one word and I save this cat, if not, I kill it. None of the monks could answer. So finally, Nam Chon killed the cat. Later on, Joju, his student, returned from the city. He heard what happened, and as a sign of mourning, he put his shoes over his head and he left. Then Nam Chon said, If you had been here, I could have saved the cat's life. Question If you had been there, how could you have saved the cat's life? Second question, why did this excellent Zen master break his precepts and kill the cat? Third, what is the meaning of Joju's putting his shoes over his head and leaving? And I see your faces and how could he have done that? I will not believe in Zen if this happens. That's your reaction. You don't save the cat in this way. How do you save the cat? Focus on that. Many times you see wartime movies, crime stories, where people's lives are at stake. And you're watching it from your armchair. Now stop the movie and imagine that you are there. How do you solve the situation? How do you save somebody's life? Because the cat is actually the start. How do you save that small little being? Okay? So that's an emotional paradox. And uh, I've been giving interviews for like 20 years and people have so many kinds of reactions and none of them saves the cat. None. But when they really become one with the situation and display the correct clarity, that saves the cat. Yours to attain. It just takes some practice. You should know that there are many reasons why we are grateful for Zen Master Sung San, but one is that he created a very good step-by-step -step approach to Kongan practice. I wouldn't call it a system because it's not logical. In retrospect, it makes perfect sense. But when you enter step-by-step -step and you learn Kongan practice, you don't feel that it makes any sense at all. In fact, you have to let go of your intellectual predictive pattern-seeking habit or your search for emotional satisfaction, okay? And when you do that, you actually act like Luke Skywalker when he had the courage to turn his rational kind of targeting mechanism off. 
and he uses his intuition, okay? <laughs> Nothing more mystical, your own intuition. So that intuition is this clarity that we have spoken about. In fact, intuition is the function of your true nature, is the direct manifestation of our true self. That's intuition. Not pattern recognition, not intellectual and emotional decoding. That's not intuitive. It's just fast. It's accurate. It's seamless, noiseless, functional. Intuition seemingly comes from nothing and returns to nothing. But in its function, it's not nothing. It is complete. So just to give you an idea on a scale of five, uh, the first three Kongan questions, they were like two and a half. This is 3.7, 3.8, Namchon's cat. And there's more difficult Kongans, also there are easier Kongans. More questions? How uh, do you train your intuition? Attain, don't know. When you attain the mind before thinking, that's training your intuition. And then you get into some kind of situation, like the lab of Zen, the laboratory, that's Kongan interview room, all right? There you can try yourself. You try yourself even several times a day. If your practice is really hot and you want answers, then you ask the teacher, please give me an interview morning and evening. But it's possible. Then your intuition gets trained. There is no explanation. But there's pointing out. Sometimes your mistake is your best teacher. And your form teacher, the person in the room, helps you use that mistake. Zen teachers never judge you. Never. So be courageous and if necessary, make mistakes. Then these mistakes can be used for your growth. All right? In Kongan interviews, the, one of the most frustrating things is that your conceptual thinking, useless, emotional patterns, useless, ideas about yourself, useless, division of past, present, future, logical systems, useless, and your reactions are so adverse. You never thought you had had it in you. I went through it in 1992, winter. I never thought I would react to not knowing a Kongan answer. It was like a wartime movie. I said, wow, this is my karma. It's not in the Konga. It's not in the book. It's not in Zen teaching. It's me producing this whole thing. So that's how you train your intuition, because you realize it, you let go of your karma, return to clarity, and next day I solved it. More questions? Right, right there. Um, so I have a question about this intuition when it uh, comes up. Uh, how do you know for sure that it's intuition? You apply it to the problem, solution appears, and if you use that solution, then the problem does not reappear. That's how you know that it was complete. Intuition is non-dualistic. It's complete. And then the solution does not reproduce the problem or create another one. Every other type of solution which is dualistic, incomplete, polarized, biased, they either reproduce the same problem or create another one. So if you look at human history, or your family history, your personal history, relationship history, you can see how you solved or did not solve problems very well. When your mind spontaneously produced something really complete, it had compassion and wisdom and strength and selflessness, we say these. But these qualities are not self-evident concretely in a given situation. How does it manifest? How do you apply it? How do you solve the actual problem? You cannot predict that. But when you did it right, then it was totally settled. Within yourself, if you solve some kind of internal problem, that problem becomes free from any labels of good and bad, from any judgment, any notion of past, present and future. Then it reintegrates with your personality and you forget it. You don't suppress it, but it stops coming up goes back to the subconscious where it belongs, okay? That's the internal solution when you deal with your own thing. But when it's an outside problem, then it's as I have said, right at the beginning. More questions? Um, it's about the, the word you use, like uh, perceiving sound. Like, do you mean the same with hearing or um, what is, or experience? Is it 
all the same or actually we perceive vibration because when your mind does not move it's totally still not vibrating then you perceive any kind of vibration in optics or light we use the mirror like we have these huge telescopes scanning the sky trying to see the universe for what it is astrophysically or astronomically those mirrors are so precise you cannot believe how much effort they put into producing just one mirror like the VLT the very large telescope it took two years to make one section of the hexagonal telescope and there are many hexagons together so it takes time for the mind to return to its unmoving and clear nature but then you can perceive any kind of vibration any kind of sound or frequency you do not become a radio and television substitute I don't mean that I mean the human frequencies those human frequencies something you can hear sometimes it's just somebody's feelings or even thoughts that kind of perception that's what I meant when you do that you do a lot of favors intrinsically for yourself and others because what we suffer from is not really an external problem sometimes people are very well fed very well housed enough money enough sensory inputs and suddenly when they turn 44 they commit suicide why this very deep isolation and loneliness they're not connected they are unable to perceive and become one when you open your mind to the world this isolation disappears this loneliness disappears the low energy states are relieved so this oneness and unmoving mind is going very far it gives you results you may not even expect and when you listen to somebody you actually relieve that person from this isolation and loneliness and the first impression of that person will be finally someone understands me and you didn't even speak you were just present 100 percent open non-reactive present absorbing but not identifying with the other person's feelings thoughts speech sometimes even actions that kind of receptive unattached non-identifying mind is our true treasure in fact this is the root of compassion and we don't talk about emotional reactions not yet emotions are a very small part of it it's important but compassion is way bigger than just an emotional stand or an emotional posture sometimes people have a lot of emotional postures that are not compassionate it's just their own idea their own habit or their own desire to control so compassion begins with this unmoving mind perceive everything that comes from a person and don't be afraid of it don't have any hopes out of it and then it's fine then you are doing a true human being's job how do you know what's necessary moment to moment see the situation clearly establish relationship clearly and then you can function clearly so if your basic clarity is there then situation relationship function also clear you don't know it you become one with it I give you an example do you like fish yes oh yes you do of course so sometimes you see fishermen with their boats and their net some of them have been fishing for decades they go out with their boats they cast their net they have the catch they come back sell it and they live none of them ever thought of catching the sea they only catch fish if they wanted to catch the sea they couldn't do it with their nets they would have to put down the net and actually jump from the boat into the sea and then they become one with the sea that's the difference so when you use your thinking you use your I my me then you use your net you want 
only conclusions and solutions and whatever. Okay? That's your fish. But that's not the sea. It's not complete. So if you want to become one with the sea, it's a totally different behavior. Put down your thinking, put down your I mommy, put down your habits, jump into the sea. And then you attain. You don't understand, but you attain. So that's how you recognize moment to moment, based on this one mind, clearly. What is your situation, what is your relationship, and what is correct function? You swim with the fish. Okay? Uh, it's a bit of a practical question about meditation. Uh, how, do you, how do you maintain uh, your practice of meditation? If you want to maintain clarity with meditation, there's a time frame, 24 hours a day. This question, what is this, has an extension. Whether you are sitting, standing, walking, or lying down, quiet, talking, awake, or in a dream, constantly, without interruption, what is this? So we use two forms, sitting and walking. But later, when you are familiar with this, you can drop the sentence, what is this? But the mind stays with the question, stays at the moment. <clears throat> like, if you have a taxi and you don't know the exact directions, but you know where you want to go, then you can tell the taxi driver, straight, left, right. They don't like it, but they accept it. And if you have to say straight, 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 a lot of times, after a while it becomes boring or unnecessary. Then you just point. They don't like that either. But the mind, if you ask this, what is this question, for many months, will get into the habit. And without the words, the question will be there. And that's when your practice becomes autonomous and independent of the form. You use the form to get into the good mind habit of staying clear all the time. That is the function of meditation. But then this autonomous function becomes independent of the form, but it can all, always go back to the form. Always, all the time, you can resume sitting, or walking, or bowing, or chanting. But it works the same way whether you cook, talk, shop, take care of the kids. You can get there, every one of us can get there. But for that we have to practice, I call it the cruising altitude of your mind. No more storms, no more takeoff or descent. You cruise and whatever happens, you keep the cruising altitude. I.e. you don't get depleted, exhausted, overtired. A little tired is okay, it's fine. But your clarity does not disintegrate, it does not dissipate. That's when you are Always in the Dharma, they say that. Never depart from the Dharma. You stay clear, you stay energized, etc. That's correct meditation. I have a, a question about the intuition you were talking about. Uh, earlier there was a question about when somebody makes you angry and you said you don't flee, don't fight, don't freeze. freeze. But isn't fleeing and freezing and fighting intuition? No. Or am I wrong? It's a habitual reaction. And if these three reactions are controlled by your karma, then it's a mistake. Okay, but I, I thought it was like in your turtle brain to freeze or to fight. Well, we don't use the turtle brain. By itself, leaving a situation or fighting a situation is neither good nor bad. Where does the order come from? Is it controlled by your habits or is it kind of sparked by your intuition? Sometimes you run. Sometimes you fight, it's true. But basic instructions for staying clear is that do not follow the habits of fleeing, freezing, or fighting. But when your intuition commands you to do so, boom, you do it without thinking. Thank you. You're welcome. You talked about um, how to not uh, breathe loudly, but uh, I'm used to breathe in and breathe out uh, for making my head clear. Mm -hmm. So, that's a little uh, different. <laughs> and I give you a hint. What do you think about that? Before Zen meditation, 
you do a lot of loud breathing. Then your head becomes very clear. Then you sit very quietly and you do quiet breathing. Then after Zen meditation, you do loud breathing again. Good. Thank you. <laughs> do you think uh, young children can use meditation? Actually, children can use fun and games a lot more than they can use formal meditation. You can permeate that or combine that with Zen. Choose the right game, the right entertainment, the right fun for the kid. It's not didactic, it's not even pedagogical. But if you practice, then you choose the right mental environment for your child. Whether it's a playground, whether it's an object, whether it's a work of art, you know that it represents something valuable. And fun and games will teach Zen to children in this way. Now, if you practice, then sooner or later, your kid will connect to that and will ask you questions. Then you can teach the form, not before. We do not impose formal meditation on kids, but they become naturally interested. And then measure it, how much you can actually teach them without turning them off without alienating them or giving them too much. Basically, if you just answer their questions, satisfy their gentle, fledgling desire to practice very carefully, then you are doing a good job. And step by step, they can get into it without feeling forced or pushed, because then they have adverse reactions. And it's not about you that your kid would have adverse reaction towards Zen, it's about them. Because if they turn this thing away, then in the most important and most critical moment of their lives, they cannot use it. Because it's alien. I don't want this. That's what my mother wanted me to do. And I don't want it. That's when it comes out. Let them take it. If they don't want to take it by themselves, it's fine. But don't force it. And then it becomes their lives if they so wish. If not, then they, it can come later. But once they say, I don't want this, it will be a reaction in their minds for a long time. So is there a way in Zen, like a method in, in a way to balance out um, being present? And like, you, like you said, being non-attached non to emptiness? Uh, and? And being a person, basically. Of course. So there's non-attachment to the person and there's non-attachment to emptiness? Yes. That's Neither basically. form nor emptiness. Okay. That's balance. Why? Because in between there is what we call suchness or thusness. That the world is just like this. This world is neither form nor emptiness. If I'm attached to this, I believe this is a stick forever. But you can burn it. In five minutes this turns into gas and ashes. So being attached to the form is a mistake. But if I'm attached to the absence of the stick, I don't think that it exists. If somebody can hit me with it, then I was wrong again. Thusness or suchness means this stick is brown. This stick is made of wood. This stick is exactly this long or short, depending how you look at it. Then it helps you perceive causality. And when you perceive cause and effect, you're on the best path to being in balance. When you see cyclical cause and effect, when you see linear cause and effect, when you see the combination of cyclical and linear cause and effect, it's wonderful. It makes you really, really quiet inside. That's the root of wisdom. Thanks. For You're answer. welcome. If I want to practice, how, how much should I practice? Because I'm struggling with time management and I do want to practice. Okay. How much time do you want to devote for Zen practice every day? What would you advise if I'm a beginner? How much time do you have? Put it here. 15 minutes? Not enough. Double it. Faites vos jeux, mesdames et messieurs. Double half, it. Half an hour. <laughs> Great. Now we're talking. So half an hour, it should begin with sitting meditation. For a few months, use one of the three techniques. Let's say for a hundred days, the same technique. Before you go to bed or put yourself to rest in whatever way, then uh, just watch your breath. Yeah. That releases all the valves and your karma goes. In the morning, once you have done your physical bathroom job, do the mind's cleansing for half an hour, religiously. 
I mean, no excuses. And this half an hour will take root in your mind and you will get into the habit of being focused and clear, no noise inside. And this kind of uh, clarity will help you immediately, the same day. And then you can smell some freedom around the corner and then you can come for a retreat. That retreat will turn your comfort zone upside down. I can promise you that. When that happens, you do some deep cleaning. And you come back and you continue with the half an hour thing. And one day you realize, ah, this is not enough. I want more. You also realize my everyday life is packed. So I have to put a stop to it, come for another retreat. And then you go deeper again. So this is a pretty good act of balance. I want to know, uh, many times it helps me uh, before I go into meditation that I uh, run fast, running in the morning. So you're not taking a bicycle? No, no. I, I'm sometimes, surprised. Sometimes I take a bicycle. This but is the most bicycle ridden yes, city yes, after I, Beijing, may, maybe. <laughs> I, but I take a uh, bike, bicycle and uh, running. And it helps me to come to a uh, catharsis which I throw out my uh, angry or my, I throw my garbage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> throw into out. the movement. Yes. Into working with yeah. the body. Yeah. Yeah. That's easy. That's why we do sports and extreme yeah. experiences, because that extreme movement and focus on the body takes away your thinking and emotions while you are doing that. Yeah. But when you don't, karma comes back. And that's why you want to do it again. If it was a final solution, it would be enough to move very intensively for like two hours, gone. But it's not gone entirely. The deep identification did not stop. Have you done any weeding in a garden? Okay, so when you cut the weed, yeah. the root remains in the soil. Yeah. Then the weed grows again. Yeah. So a smart gardener waits for the rain. The rain, because otherwise you have to go very deep and dig, and this is very difficult. Even then, a little part of the root can get stuck inside because the soil is very dry. Smart gardener waits for the rain, but doesn't let the weed grow the next day. So next morning, when the soil is very soft, then goes in with a knife, and then very slowly pulls the weed out with a complete root. And that's when we meditate, we can perceive the whole thing. When you perceive there's a distance between you and your karma, that distance is detachment. That distance is non-identification. This non-identification brings you wisdom and compassion. That's what makes the mind's soil wet enough. And then, spontaneously, you can root this out without willpower, without intellect, without emotional patterns. You just weed it out with the root of identification totally removed, then you're free. Then you can move, not move, no problem. All right? But it takes work. It takes work and sometimes movement is necessary. I'm not discarding your method. I'm saying that it's partial. But partial effect is also important. That's why in Mahayana we bow a lot. Sometimes we bow and this movement before the Buddha puts Buddha nature to the very top of our internal hierarchy, as well as puts all the energy into the movement itself, and then your energy travels down, and in the front part of the body, your mind gets relieved of all this karma, and then when you sit, you can sit very well, so I really know what you mean. But without sitting, without not moving body, not moving speech, not moving mind, you cannot finish the job, because the root, the last part, which is always the first part later, remains there. There's something I don't quite understand. When we are talking about taking things out of a backpack and throwing it away, like bad, bad karma or karma... Any kind of karma any that kind, is any bothering kind? you. Sometimes your good karma bothers you, it's terrible. <laughs> okay, any kind of karma. This feels like, like, like a, 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 an action, doing this. In the metaphor, yes. But yeah, in but the when, mind, when it happens the, very spontaneously. In the process of meditating, when do I do that? I mean, it's, it's, it's about not thinking or not thinking about specific karma. 
experiences. You don't think about it, it's true. The metaphor gives you a dimension, some kind of progress or an object going from one place to another. I do this so that you would have an understanding and your intellect would have something to hold on to. But in reality, it doesn't happen in this way. <laughs> Actually, meditation gives you this experience with any kind of karma all the time. For instance, you made a mistake, you suppressed it, you feel guilty about it, and this mistake inside comes back. Because you see it, it bothers you. Bad conscience. If you really meditate correctly, you don't judge yourself for this, but you see your mistake. But you do not become a bad person because you made a mistake. You are just mistaken. So then you put this right before the mirror. The pieces of the jigsaw puzzle start to fall into the right place because you don't touch it. If you don't judge yourself, you don't judge your karma. Very important. Right away, instead of a burden, this karma became an asset because you learned from it. Because you saw it for what it is. You didn't label it good or bad, right or wrong. You just saw cause and effect. And then you determine, do I want this again or not? It's a very spontaneous conclusion. So that's how this subconscious burden becomes an asset. Because you attain your mistake. You see cause and effect. Where it came from, where it went. What it was feeding on and what it fed. How it changed you. How it changed your world. And then, instead of being a burden, it becomes a potential. It becomes an asset. Mm -hmm. Instead of a brick in the wall, it becomes a stone in the pavement. There are these many small stones in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. You make these roads and pavements out of it, even tram lines, small stones. But some buildings are made of the same stone. They're very thick walls, okay? It depends on you. You build walls or you build roads. Same stone, same karma, your choice. I understand, but then, then, then it's possible that at, at one point you meditate over something. Mm -hmm. For example, something that you know is bothering you yeah. and you just lay it before you, you. Yeah, like I've said before, you put it before your mind mirror and you say, what is this? Where does this come from? Then the map becomes complete becomes reintegrated into your normal personality because it stops being extremely good or extremely bad, you're free. That's liberation. When you put the problem before you, it's a clarity. Uh, the danger, I think, is maybe that you're going to analyze the problem. You analyze the problem even before that. Like now. Go on. I don't know what to say now. Good. You came to the point where I wanted you to be. This you. don't know stops the analysis. You had a beautiful question and you opened it up. Great. So this don't know stops the analysis. That's all there is to it. Then your mirror is clean. No more ups and downs. No more pieces. No more systems. Originally, no divisions. Originally, no dualities. Originally, no thinking. You come back to that, you're complete. Great. So I hope all of us attain completeness, clarity, and oneness. Then we have wisdom and compassion and selfless help as a spontaneous result. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your wonderful questions, for your presence. I hope to practice with you again in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you.